Okay, now that we've talked about countdown latches, let's talk about cyclic barriers. And I'll explain how they work and we'll compare and contrast them with countdown latches. So a cyclic barrier allows a set of threads to all wait for each other to reach a common barrier point. If you go back and you read the definition of a countdown latch, you see it's got ever so slightly different definition of how it works. Uh, also, a fairly simple interface, but a few extra things, in particular the reset method is, is something that's different. So a cyclic barrier is yet another barrier synchronizer in Java. It's well suited for fixed size, cyclic entry or exit barriers. You can use it for one shot barriers, but it, it might be overkill, although there are reasons that you still might want to use it. Um, it's most useful for a fixed size number of threads that want to wait for all threads to complete before they all proceed. The other thing that it has that Catholic Dental does not have is you can reset the count at any point, although it is a little bit surprising how it works internally. Internally, it does not apply the bridge pattern. It doesn't implement any job interfaces. It doesn't use the abstract cube synchronizer framework. It, it works by its own implementation. Let's talk about some of the key methods. So the constructor is given a fixed number of parties to wait on. And I don't know why they use the word parties, but they're threads. And it's really important to remember this because I can't tell you the number of times I've been doing stuff with cyclic barriers and I forget that you've got to have a fixed number of threads and all those threads need to work together. So if you have a, if you have a cyclic barrier and you give it a count of five and you only have two threads that ever call it, it's going to block waiting for those other three threads to show up, right? It's like uh, Samuel Beckett's waiting for Godot, right? It'll just wait and wait and wait. It'll never go anywhere. So you have to have a fixed number of threads that are identical to the number of parties. And that's, it's a bit of a subtle thing. Once you work with it long enough, you, you get the hang of it, but it can be a little confusing at first. One of the really cool things it has is this thing called a barrier action. And this barrier action will run when the Barrier is tripped. What needs to be tripped is all the parties that were waited for have all shown up. So whenever all the parties have shown up, then the barrier action is called back. And this is performed, the barrier action is called by the last thread that enters the barrier. And while the barrier action is called, all the parties are suspended. So all the threads are not running. So this is an atomic operation relative to the threads. You may ask, why the heck do we need a barrier action? Well, it's useful for updating any shared state that's needed before the parties continue to run. So this is most obviously useful if you're doing things that require cycles, right? You're going to be doing it multiple times, like the assembly line, the assembly line example I gave you. So again, you know, using my analogy and stretching it a bit further, the cars are coming down the assembly line, and the next car shows up. People do their work, and then when the, you know, the car moves down and the next car shows up, before the workers start to work on it, maybe they all you know, go and drink coffee, or maybe they all go and read the instructions on what the next thing is they're going to do, or whatever. But that operation takes place while the workers are not working, they're suspended, and you can update or initialize something with them all suspended. I'll show you an example here shortly. The count is reset to the initial number of parties after the barrier is tripped. So after everybody's shown up and, and you're all done, then it resets back to the initial number of parties and you can continue on again. Here are the methods. The methods are really simple. Uh, await is the most common thing to call, and that waits until all the parties arrive, the barrier is reset, or the thread is interrupted. Assuming that nothing goes wrong, it's usually until all the parties arrive. It returns the arrival index of the thread at the barrier. And you can check when the count is zero, that means it's the, the last one. And you could do something at that point if you want to, if you don't care that the threads are not going to be suspended. Await simply waits for the passage of time and all these other conditions. And then reset sets the barrier back to its initial state. If all the parties are done, then nothing bad happens, it just resets. If there are barriers, if there are threads or parties waiting in a wait and reset is called, that causes all of those waiting parties slash threads to receive a broken barrier exception. So that's how they know that they've broken. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so basically that's 
what you might call a fail fast technique. So once you're reset, you tell anybody who's still waiting, hey, the barrier's been broken, and they can decide whether they want to go back and wait or, or do something else. All right, that's the end of that discussion. As I, again, as I said, it's a very short um, topic. Now that we've talked about what cyclic barriers are conceptually, let's take a look at an example. And this example will implement the same thing as the previous example in terms of the functionality, but it'll do it in a slightly different way, and of course it'll use the uh, cyclic barrier instead of the path that latch. So again, that's what the program looks like. It looks the same. It more or less runs the same. The code is different. Let's take a look at the code. Uh, and this illustrates a whole bunch of interesting things. So you can see here's the cyclic barrier unit test. It goes ahead and it gets the tests that we want to run. And then it creates two cyclic barriers. And you can see here what it does is it makes the count be the number of tests we're going to run, each of which will run in its own thread, plus one for the main thread, which is the thread that's going to wait. And we'll see why we do that in a second. That's the entry barrier. And likewise, the exit barrier is the same thing. We're going to wait for everybody to finish, including the main thread. So that's why you have a one there as well. OK, so given those counts, we also give it a barrier action. And this barrier action is kind of fun. What it does is uh, this, this particular test, as you can see here, runs for multiple cycles. And every time we're done with a cycle, we're going to reinitialize the inputs over which we'll be using to compute the GCD. So the way this works under the hood is we have a, a static method called initialize inputs, and you give it the number of iterations you want to do to test the GCD computation. And what it does, and hopefully we'll have a little time to look at the code, or you can look at the code on your own, it goes ahead and it makes two arrays of random numbers between zero and some max in. And then when it does the computation, it takes each of those values in each of the arrays one at a time and computes the GCD of that value. And that way, each test is running on exactly the same input. So what we're doing here is we're reinitializing those inputs as our barrier action. So every time we're done with one cycle, we reinitialize it to start with fresh new input on the next cycle. So that was a nice example of, of using barrier actions. Down here, we then iterate through each cycle. And in each cycle, we're going to go ahead and create a new cyclic barrier tester with our barriers, exit and entry barriers, and start a thread to run that. All those threads will go off. We're not going to start running yet. We're going to print a test. And then we're going to call await. Now, what's interesting about this call to await versus the other call to countdown that was in the countdown latch implementation is that this version will cause all the tester threads to have to be initialized and reach a common starting point before any of them can run. That's different from the way the countdown labs work. The countdown lab simply said, wait until the main thread is ready, and then any of the other threads can run in whatever order they start up. The cyclic barrier says everybody has to wait, like the horses at the horse race, until someone starts them all. That's the main difference. Yes, and uh, oh, good question. So let's let's be very concrete. Let's say we have four uh, GCD implementations we want to test. So that's four, right? We're gonna have a thread for each of those things, and then we also want to account for the main thread. So now we have five threads, right? Because we have four GCD threads plus the main thread. And the way that await works is it will wait until and threads call await to let all the threads to run. So what we're doing here is we have to count ourselves because we're a waiter also. And so we have, we're waiting here for all those four threads to start. This one is the fifth. When they're all started, or rather when they all call await, they can all start to run. Now, what you see here is when the main thread starts to run, it immediately turns around and waits for everything to finish. So it's, it's not doing anything very exciting. It, it could do something more exciting than this, but in this particular example, it's not doing much more exciting. But the general point is that we need to count the, main, the waiting thread in our count, because otherwise, we can't wait for everybody to start at the same time. Then after we, so as I just explained to answer your question, when a wait 
returns, then that means everybody's up and running. And then we wait on the exit barrier for all the threads to finish. So let's go take a look at how the test works. This is going to look very similar to the other one, just a few differences that are minor. Um, we initialize our fields, which are entry and exit barriers. We call await. Now, again, the difference between this call and the countdown lab version is that this guy's going to wait. He's not going anywhere until everybody's ready to run. So it's, it's more coordinated than the previous version. Once everybody's running, it runs its test. And once it's done, it'll wait for everybody to finish. So that's the main difference. OK, 